part of Del Shannon Weekend here in Battle Creek this year from June 23rd through the 25th. On Sunday the 25th was a special event called the Del Shannon Historic Legacy event where we featured Brian Young who is the biographer of a new Del Shannon book coming out this year. And so he did a, a very informative presentation on the life of Del Shannon and I was able to film that for you. So here it is. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thanks for coming out, first of all. I apologize my friend, uh, James Copenhagen. His back went out uh, after the concert the other day. Those guitars can weigh a lot on your back. And, you know, he managed through uh, yesterday, but he's doing a little, doing a little more rough uh, today, so he, he's unfortunately not going to be here. But um, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and I want to apologize up front because uh, my publisher is about two weeks behind on my book. So that means it's not here, but I will, we'll find a way to make it, <laughs> make it up to you guys. Um, but I, I, I don't want you to, to think it was any fault of uh, you know, the Battle Creek Museum or anything like that. That rests with me. I take the full responsibility on that. I, I would rather just have it come out where it's, it's done correctly than have a couple of botched, messed up <laughs> chapters and everything. Um, but I'm going to kind of run through the story today um, to kind of give you an idea of how uh, Dale Shannon's you know, career and even his life had started and, and uh, how, how the fame uh, happened and we'll kind of just go through that just like, just like a day by day kind of walk through, through the years there. Um, I want to start with a quote. Um, from uh, an R.D. Ronstadt, and I wish I could have wrote this because this, this is a, a good little synopsis, but Dell's life story reads like the movie, no embellishment needed, a small town boy born into poverty and social irrelevance, an unsupportive father and a sympathetic mother, an early obsession with popular music, a tepid education uh, ameliorated by a, career educated, uh, a caring educator and father figure, a young adulthood spent in menial jobs, in early marriage, burdened with financial struggles, in army enlistment, posting and discharge, more menial jobs, financial struggles, uh, a part-time band gig in a rowdy club, leading to a fortuitous encounter, a label signing, a failed first session, a hugely successful second session, an overnight triumph, a string of hits, major tours, a conflict with management including royalty disputes, a British invasion, a slow gradual sink into obscurity, a succession of, re of re record deals, a string of deserving but commercially unsuccessful recordings, a descent into self-destructive addiction, oldies tour grinds, scattered behind the scenes successes including writing, producing, arranging, and promoting, an addiction conquered, some hints of a comeback, and a shocking, unfathomable ending. All right. So I guess I, I guess I'll start with uh, you know Charles Westover was born in. Grand Rapids in 1934. Uh, his parents were Burton Leone Westover. His father had worked for um, a streetcar company in Grand Rapids, and then shortly thereafter, he ended up moving to back to Coopersville, where he, where he was from. And uh, then he worked for the. Um, the, what is it? The, the Road Commission um, out there. Uh, and so they were kind of a poor family, and, and uh, Kirkusville was small. Um, it's kind of one of those suburban um, farming towns. Um, he uh, started to play the kazoo um, at an early age, and then he got into the ukulele that his mother had played. 
and uh, she taught, I think she knew three or four chords, so she taught him like, uh, you know, the doodly do and, and those kind of songs. And then um, a few years later, he found a guitar um, in the next town over for five dollars that he paid for, didn't have a pick, and his fingers bled, and uh, he had to, uh, but you know, he learned how to, you know, from a chord book, how to play the guitar. And uh, from that, he ended up graduating into uh, his first new guitar when he turned 14. It was his birthday fell a couple days after Christmas, so it was like a Christmas birthday combination. And then he got his first series of robot guitar, and that's when he started to do uh, strum and play Hank Williams and get into that kind of music. Um, and so a lot of it was, you know, polka music and the ink spots, you know, E3, and he learned falsetto. And, and kind of got through that. Um, and then when he got into high school, um, he, well, I want to tell one story before he gets into high school. So he, he did a few things um, with, uh, you know, as all boys will probably do, you know, he was chasing chickens and, and doing, you know, running through people's yards, and one of the things that he did is um, he and a couple of buddies, they would go through, they would cut through somebody's yard on the way to school, and they'd sing, I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. A hell of 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 an engineer. So if you think in the 1940s, you know, that's cursing, and, and he would get in trouble, and then of course the parents would, would uh, phone, phone uh, Mrs. Westover and say, hey, your boy's out here, you know, <laughs> cursing with the other boys, and uh, I wanted to tell that story because it kind of makes relevance a little bit later. Uh, but I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, you know, he did other pranks. Uh, there was one time, one of the, the little uh, diner, he had found a skunk and he had put the skunk into the, into the diner there. And, yeah. So it was a little bit of a, a rebel. Uh, when he got into high school, um, he was always looking for attention. His parents, um, uh, his parents got him a uh, Howdy Doody doll. Um, everyone, anyone remember Buffalo Bob Smith and Howdy Doody? Yeah, that was his first little uh, ventriloquist doll, and then he would start with that little, you know, puppet and and uh, entertain his friends and, and uh, classmates. Um, and so, you know, I think that's when he probably decided he wanted to be an entertainer of some sort. Uh, and then he got, you know, he was playing his guitar and he would bring it to school um, and he would get himself in trouble because, you know, he was kind of seen as the, maybe the black sheep of Groupville. <laughs> you know, it's a, um, you know, small town and, and uh, in those days, you know, that was probably frowned upon, you know, and, and um, it wasn't quite rock and roll yet, but that kind of was starting to come in. Maybe not quite yet, but, you know, 52, 53, he's still playing. Uh, Hank Williams and, and such, but uh, so what had happened is that he ended up uh, being a distraction and, and uh, getting in trouble with his teachers and everything. And his principal, by the man of a uh, named Russell Conran, he was the principal of the Coopersville High School, and he ended up becoming like the father figure or the authoritative figure for uh, for young Chuck Westover. Uh, he he kind of negotiated a deal. He said, "I tell you what, I'll let you play." Guitar, you know, at noon hour, or what they call lunchtime, uh, in exchange, you know, or you can play in, in the uh, in the locker rooms, you know, and in sports games and things like that. As long as you do your work, you, you know, you need to pass school and get through, um, and not be a nuisance to your teachers. And so that ended up working out pretty well. Um, and he was always very encouraging, you know, where where uh, Chuck's own father wasn't really a big fan of the guitar, although his mother was really supportive of it. Um, in his senior year, um, in f well, 52, late 52, he, uh, he met a girl named Karen, and he started dating, and he asked her to the prom, um, and she said she'd go with him, and, and everything was all great and hunky-dory for a while, and uh, then at the last minute, she changed her mind, and she says, you know what, I can't, I can't, uh, can't go with you to the prom, so he, she ended up going with another guy. And uh, that broke his heart. That was his first 
big blow or, or breakup, however you want to call it. And uh, there was a quote that he had said at one time um, that I want to kind of read for you uh, that he told Dick Clark, um, Americans are neurotics. Uh, Del Shannon told Dick Clark in an interview for Rock and Roll, or Rock and Roll and Remember, he said, in a relationship, you depend on each other. In a breakup, one can just be devastated. The wife leaves a guy, he's freaking out, and his pride is crushed. I'm so sad you left. Dell's point was that in a relationship, you know, during a breakup, one person leaves either because they found someone new or they just want out of that relationship and they feel freed. You know, but the other person in the breakup, they're the poor unsuspecting soul who can be seen as the victim, the one whose heart is truly broken or crushed maybe even blindsided, and some never recovered. Shannon may have been that poor soul. He was dumped in high school by a girl he asked to the prom, and it obviously crushed him because he kept writing sad songs that pinpoint back to that main event. So, when you think of Runaway and Little Town Flirt and some of these songs, they kind of go back to this girl in, uh, in uh, well, in Allendale, Michigan. Um, but uh, it's the tragedy and the triumph, you know, these great songs come out of, out of uh, something so sad that happened. Um, so after, after that breakup, he meets a girl um, at the Century Theater in Coopersville. He goes, he goes with a friend of his to the, uh, to the movie theater to see Gone with the Wind. And Shirley is there with a friend, and Chuck asks her out, hey, you want to go out with me? And she's like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> she's freaking out, freaked out and everything. But she was new in town. She was living with her brother. Um, Shirley's father had died, and Shirley's one of 13 kids. I don't know if any of you knew that or not. So, you know, the, uh, her mother was a widow and 13 kids to her finish raising is pretty tough. So she went to go live with her older brother um, in Troopersville. And then that's how they met. And their first date, they went to go see Frankie uh, Yankovic, the, the uh, accordionist, the polka player. <laughs> not Weird Al Yankovic, but Frankie Yankovic, and they're not related. Um, so, you know, rock and roll wasn't in yet, and it sounds a little fuddy-duddy, but at the time, you know, it was probably you know, a good date, and they went to Fruitport, which was near Coopersville, and, and uh, they started to get to know each other and grew from there. Um, and then, uh, you know, Chuck Wester had, had graduated high school, and uh, in September of 1954, he and Shirley got married. Um, it was, you know, a nice, quiet, candlelit um, wedding. And um, shortly after that, he ended up getting drafted into the army, so he had to leave a couple months right after he got married. Um, he went out to Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training, and uh, a couple months later, Shirley had uh, come by to say, you know, come, come to live with them for a while, and then she had to go back to Coopersville, um, uh, where she worked as a, a telephone operator, I think she said. Um, and then he ended up getting relocated to Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and so she went with him to, to Germany there in 54, uh, um, where he got into a band called the, uh, uh, the Get Up and Go Show, is what it was called. And there were, they had this little group that they called the Cool Flames. Excuse me. Uh, and the Cool Flames, um, I think there were seven, seven of them in the group, and, and uh, Chuck was the guitar player. So he wasn't a singer yet, but he's learning his, you know, getting his chops and learning how to play and, and playing professionally and, and kind of going, or semi-professionally, I should say, and going around um, the country of Germany to play for the American troops and, and um, learn his, you know, guitar and, and get uh, strong with that and get kind of get a, a little taste of what it would be like, uh, you know, to be an entertainment entertainer, and I'm sure that that probably grew on him at some point. Um, so when he was discharged from the army, um, he came back to Coopersville, and there were the, there wasn't many uh, jobs to be had. Uh, 
so he re -enlist, he he enlisted in the um, Air Force, provided that he would be stationed at Fort Custer, so he could be close to his family. So he was in the Air Force for a short stint um, when his father had suffered a brain aneurysm. He had lifted a piece of heavy tile, and, and you know, uh, and that happened, I think, April Fool's Day in 1959. His, his dad got injured and ended up spending the rest of his life in a, um, in a rest home. So he got an honorable discharge to get out and uh, decided to stay in Battle Creek, and that's how they decided to stay here. Um, and so he got a job at Brunswick uh, Furniture Company, or the factory, and, and uh, started nailing um, legs onto chairs. And um, I know that some, some folks out there, I know that uh, Ralph worked with them, Ralph Warden, uh, and uh, Wes, and there were some other guys, Bob Popenhagen, that's where these guys kind of start coming into the picture, anyone that knows, you know, the Popenhagen family. Um, that's how Bob met Chuck Westover, is through Brunswick, and uh, Wes Kilborn. All these guys kind of became, you know, good friends, and I don't want to say a crew, but kind of like a little, you know, a tight little, little, yeah, little group that, uh, that hang out together, and, um, in, you know, in, in Chuck playing guitar, he wanted to get a second job and ended up getting a job at the Hilo Club for Doug DeMont. Um, there was a guy named Jim Ray who worked at a gas station and he knew Doug DeMont and decided, uh, he asked, he says, hey, you know, is there a way that I can meet this Doug DeMont guy? I want to try to get into his band. And so they ended up meeting up and, and they played a little bit and he had to kind of audition, so to speak. And, and uh, he got the job, and he, put, he started at the, the high-low club. Um, and the, they were doing country and western music. And Doug DeMott was a guy that um, I don't think he gets his credit. You know, he was a, uh, he was a country western singer um, who had started, well, he, he, had, he tried to get his first break on the Louisiana Hayride, which is what broke Elvis and Johnny Cash and some other, you know, named people. Well, Doug DeMont had his chance. He did get on the Louisiana Hayride. Unfortunately, he didn't, you know, get off to bigger and better, better things. But he did join a group called the Echo Valley Boys, and they were around to Battle Creek through the '50s, doing mostly country and western. Um, and then, you know, Doug had a family and, and uh, ended up, uh, you know, getting out of the band and, and staying, you know, getting the job at the High Low Club, and just staying local. So uh, he had a couple guys, uh, a guy named Lauren Duggar, who was a bass player. I don't know if anyone knew of Lauren Duggar. Um, and, uh, and Bob Hopenhagen as, as a guitar player, uh, and Chuck Westover. And so DeMont had played for about a, a year or two at the High Low Club. He ended up getting a record, uh, not a record deal. Oh yeah, I should probably. Clicking a few of these here. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Michael. Let me just run through some of these. So, so this is, uh, I think this is him and uh, Chuck in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, this is uh, the Get Up and Go show um, in Stuttgart, Germany. There's uh, Chuck in the corner there. Get back to that one. So here's the High Low Club which was on 45 Capitol Avenue. Um, it's been raised, it was raised, I think, in, in the 80s. Um, you guys probably all know that. But, um, but this is where, um, you know, Runaway was, was written. Some of the interior shots of the High Low Club. And from what I understand, it was, you know, it was a pretty ritzy place in the 30s, and then it started to kind of go downhill, and by the time uh, Chuck Westover was playing there, it ended up being a dive, so it's, and then it got a renovation, I think, in late 61, but by that point, he had already, you know, uh, his career had already taken off, and then it became the Gilbert Lounge. But this is what it looked like in the interior. Get the stage there, it was only maybe six to 12 inches off the ground, so when fights broke out, <laughs> yeah, the band was in trouble. They literally unplugged and walked off stage <laughs> because you didn't, didn't want anything to happen to you. Um, and that's Doug DeMont singing there. 
uh, and then Chuck Plain on the left, and that's L.D. Duggar or Lauren Duggar uh, on stand-up bass. And this is what the country and western band kind of looked like for a couple years. <clears throat> Once in a while, um, you know, Doug encouraged Chuck to, to sing, and he wasn't a singer. He never played or he never sang until he was with Doug DeMont, and he was allowed to, you know, why don't you sing a Conway Twitty song or something, you know, one or two songs a night, which wasn't a lot, but it kind of broke him in a little bit to get out of the guitarist stage and into singing. And thank goodness that happened because look where it led. <laughs> Here's Doug DeMont again, probably a little bit later. I'm not sure what year this is, but, but um, obviously a little bit later. So what happened is that, uh, long story short, Doug DeMont got, got fired, um, which happened a couple of times. He got hired and fired and hired and fired and hired and fired. Well, eventually he ended up getting fired and he ended up having, uh, he started up another band on Harmonia. Um, I think it was called The Flamingo, it was a different, club, some of you guys probably know it. So then, uh, Ma and Pa Gilbert that owned the LaSalle Hotel, or the Gilbert Hotel, I'm sorry, uh, and, uh, you know, the High Low Club, they asked Charles Westerf if he wanted to take over the band, and so he did, and uh, he called it the Charlie Johnson Band, and he took, Lauren Duggar was his bass player, and Bob Hoban, Hobanagan was his guitar player, and, uh, but he didn't have a drummer, so he needed to find a drummer. So he drove out to Hickory Corners, got a lead from somebody, and there was a guy named uh, Dick Parker, uh, who was from Richland, and he was a kid. So he had just graduated from Richland High School in 59, uh, and had been, it was summer, summer of 59, and, and uh, you know, he's probably 18, and got hired as the, as the drummer. And uh, so they so they had a group and they st they started as the Charlie Johnson Band and for a while they were going and then uh, Bob Copenhagen ended up getting a job at Green's Tavern so he ended up fronting his a band himself he got a better gig so uh, Chuck Westover needed to get a, a guitar player and he hired a guy named Dick Pace and Dick Pace um, came in and then it was New Year's Eve of 1959 that uh, you know, the, the High Low Club is known to have been a, a rough place, but in 1959 on New Year's Eve they had a, uh, there was a guy and, and a gal that got into a fight and he stabbed her and she died. And that was enough for, yeah, for killing on New Year's Eve. And so that was enough for Dick Pace to say, he was a family man, he had two kids and a wife, he says, you know what, I'm out of here, I can't do this. So he quit. Um, and found another place and, and uh, ended up moving to California to play for Knott's Berry Farm. So he was a guitarist there for quite a while. Um, but that left Westover in a lurch because now he needed somebody to, you know, he needed a, another guitar player. Um, so he was looking for another guitar player and his drummer, Dick Parker, said, you know, I know this guy in Kalamazoo. He, he has this uh, band called the White Bucks. Um, but he, he's a piano player, and, but he has this little organ. Uh, his name is Max Crook. And Chuck goes, nah, I'm not looking for a, guitar, uh, a keyboard player, I want a guitar player. And he, some, he goes, no, 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 this guy, he has this little machine with other worldly sounds, and he was on, he's already been on record. Um, Max Crook was on record, it was a novelty tune called Get That Fly that he did with his group, the White, White Bucks, but they were on the dock label. And at the time, that was the same label that Pat Boone was signed to. So, I mean, Elvis was huge, but Pat Boone was huge too at that time. I mean, he was a you know, big, big star. Um, so there was some kind of clout there. Unfortunately, Max's uh, you know, novelty tune, Get That Fly, didn't really go anywhere. Um, I think it was a little bit of a local, local hit. But uh, the important thing was is that Max had contacts. He was in the tape machine, you know, reel to reels, he had tape machines. Um, he had already uh, got discovered somewhat and uh, had some contacts with DJs. So he, Max Crook came out to an audition for Chuck. Uh, when, he, when Chuck heard him and you know, the, the little music Tron organ there, he said, boy, you're hired. You know, and, and signed him on the spot, so to speak. Uh, he didn't have to sign him, but 
he, he joined the band. And so that was kind of a, a pivotal piece uh, or a turning point in Chuck's career because as soon as Max got hired into the band, within two weeks, they went and cut their first acetate up in Grand Rapids um, at our theater. It was like a little movie theater place, but the guy that worked there had a uh, uh, kind of a pay-as-you-go, you know, like where you could press acetate records, you know, one-off kind of things. And so he was able to record a couple songs. He did Face of an Angel and a song called He Doesn't Care. Um, and so that happened like this, and then that was when uh, when Chuck had his first copyright. So this is February 1960. This is still a full year before Runaway. Um, so he, there was a DJ in Battle Creek named Charlie O. Does anybody remember Chuck Marsh or Charlie O. Marsh? Yeah. W E L L. Yeah. Okay. Well, he was the first DJ that kind of shopped Chuck's um, face of an angel uh, demo around. And he, he drove out to Chicago. We went to talk to Checker and you know Mercury, VJ Records. Everyone said, "Yeah, it sounds good. We'll get back to you." You know, the first case of Jive. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't pan out for him. So there were a couple other songs around about that same time that did use the same title, "Face of an Angel." So maybe it was that, or maybe it just wasn't a good song. Um, it probably wasn't that good of a song. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so he was kind of in the dumps that he, he didn't get that uh, put out, so he's still working at the High Low Club and he's still trying to make it. Uh, and then they run into uh, Ollie McLaughlin, who was a DJ out of Ann Arbor. And actually he was the guy that had uh, discovered Max Crook and, and published Max's first single. So they, they said, well why don't, why don't you have Ollie McLaughlin come out to the High Low Club? So I said, okay. So he came out to to listen to a few tapes or a few songs, um, and uh, I don't think they had run away yet. They had some. They had a couple songs, "The Search" and "I'll Always Love You," and there were some other songs like "Johnny's Got the Blues" and "The Prom." And he had a few songs that he gave to uh, uh, to Ollie McLaughlin to take back to some guys in Detroit. And the guys in Detroit, they were called Harry Balk and Irving McConnick of Artists Incorporated. Uh, they had. Uh, Johnny and the Hurricanes, you know, uh, Red River Rock, uh, Reveille Rock, you know, Beatnik Fly, um, and that group, Johnny and the Hurricanes, were the uh, they were like the instrumental group of '59. You know, they were uh, they were from Toledo, but um, their management was based out of Detroit. Um, so out of that. Uh, out of out of getting those uh, those tapes, you know, sent to those guys, they decided to sign him, and that was the summer of 1960. He got signed, um, but decided they, they want they wanted to record him, but he didn't. Um, uh, they decided to record him with with four or five other um, groups that they had, and and a guy named. Tom Clay, which was a, a DJ in Detroit. Um, so they go to their first recording session, and um, Tom Clay did his songs first. And they were kind of a spoken word novelty type, and then Chuck did his. Uh, and The Search and I'll Always Love You, those two songs were kind of, I don't want to say jazz flavor, but they were more like a Frank Sinatra, you know crooner type songs and Dell was nervous and uh, you know his vibrato wasn't the best and so it didn't those songs didn't come out um, even though they had a great string arrangement and everything so he's told why don't you go back to the to, uh, to Battle Creek and uh, write an up tempo song come up with something else that's a little bit better so he goes okay so he's a little bummed out but he goes back to uh, to the high low club and, and then that's when magic or lightning in a bottle happened one night and uh, they were just playing, uh, you know, a couple couple songs, and all of a sudden they get out of one song, and they um, Max Crook played a, an A minor and a G on the piano, and that was something a little bit different at the time. And uh, Chuck goes, "What was that? Did you just play?" He goes, "Well, an A minor G." You know, dun, 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 dun. So they kind of went through that, and they started going through these chord progressions. And then as they got the song built in about 15 to 20 minutes, the owner says, hey, you guys stop, I'm paying you to, to 
to play for the crowd and you guys are sitting up here doing whatever you're doing so they kind of had to stop and you know knock it off and um, they had kind of the structure of the song together but no lyrics yet so you know they finished off their set for that night and the next day um, Dell was working at a carpet store um, on Columbia Avenue uh, called the Carpet Outlet and while he was on a couple rolls of, of carpet in the way that Chuck said that uh, you know nobody was really buying a lot of carpet there so he had a lot of downtime to play on his guitar and uh, he, he ended up writing the lyrics you know the runaway lyrics that day and about halfway through his day um, it was about lunchtime or so Wes Kilborn was one of his friends that uh, you know, from the Brunswick factory came in and uh, brought a bottle of wine with them and they kind of sat down and they talked he said hey I want you to listen to this song that I just wrote it was called it's called Little Runaway that's what he had for a title Little Runaway before it became Runaway so and there was a whole second verse that never was put into the song so there's whole this whole second verse is in there and there's scribblings of it somewhere I think Shirley's got it um, but uh, yeah so he finished off the song Runaway and Wes Kilborn was there to kind of encourage him and and uh, you know, watch the song come together. And then Chuck goes, well, the song needs a B-side, so I might as well write something else. And so that he wrote the, the, the B-side, Jody, that same day. So within a matter of 24 hours, he had run away in the, in the B-side, Jody, um, for a song. So they ended up going back to Ollie McLaughlin, and they said, hey, we got some more songs. Can we get these in? Um, and usually what happens is if a singer gets a shot and they don't make it their first time that's it they're done you know they don't usually get a second chance but for some reason he got lucky where they decided well we're we're going back in to to uh put out this johnny and the hurricanes big sounds of uh, album so they had to go back to new york anyhow so they said okay we'll try to squeeze in um you know this this runaway and things but we like that thing with with max and that organ so we want to record him too Okay, so they decided to do what they call a split session, where in New York what they would do is you have a three hour recording session and they would do four songs. And you get it. Um, normally it would be one artist that would do four songs. You, you record the four songs, you find the best one out of it, and maybe the worst or something, and you put that as the B side. And so you had a chance to have maybe two singles out of it. Well, in this case, uh, Chuck got to have Runaway and Jody and, and his keyboard player, Max Crook got his shot, you know, with, with a, a song called The Snake, and The Wanderer was the, was a B-side, it was an instrumental, uh, not the Dion hit. Um, so the, he's allowed to drive to New York. Um, he wasn't flown this time, since this is the second time he was kind of on his own, and on, on his own budget. So he had, a, I think it was a 55 or 56 Plymouth, and uh, the heater was broken on it, and the muffler fell off, and uh, Max Crook was, he didn't like smoke, cigar smoke, because uh, Chuck had smoked a good guitar at the time. I smoked a, <laughs> a cigar at the time, not a guitar. Um, and, and so, you know, the windows were down, and, and uh, Shirley and, and Max's wife, Joanne, were, they were wrapped in blankets in the back seat um, because they were freezing, you know, like it's you know, January that they go to record Runaway out in New York. So they drive from Detroit to New York to record this. Um, and when they get there, uh, the two wives decide, well, you know, the husbands are doing their thing, you know, they're, you know, they're in their music, but we want to go walk, you know, they're in New York, so they're, they're from, you know, the small towns and all that, they want to go walk around New York and, and check out, uh, you know, what's going on, you know, the happenings in New York. And so Shirley and Joanne, they go walking around and they see, uh, they see a, a, a game show called Beat the Clock. Anybody remember Beat the Clock? Oh, yes. All right. Well, just before Beat the Clock got canceled, like three days before they got canceled um, in 61, it was uh, uh, Joanne Crook was the second contestant on that show because they had just popped in. Shirley was too scared, but Joanne raised her hand and said, yeah, I'll be, you know, and so they pulled her in, okay, and she had to do like a dark game or something. And I wish we had video footage of that because I'd love to see it, but I don't, I don't know if, who at CBS or who's got something, but, but uh, if that video footage exists, but that would be something something to see so they're out doing that while you know uh chuck and Matt, uh chuck well i should say he's by Dell. you know at this point he's decided to call himself del shannon because uh 
you know, in those days you wanted to have a name to have a little more punch, and they said, well, Chuck Westover doesn't have any ammunition, you know, it doesn't sound like a, a good song, so come up with something. So he came up with a song, or he came up with a, the name Del Shannon, and that was, uh, there was a guy at the Hilo Club named Bob White, and he said, one of these days I'm going to be a wrestler, I'm going to call myself Mark Shannon. And they said, Mark Shannon? No, oh, that sounds like a detective. Well, I like the name Shannon, but I don't like the name Mark. And then uh, his carpet store box had just bought a brand new Cadillac DeVille. And he said, oh, I like DeVille. I'll contract, contract that and it just costs to make it Dell, you know, so I'll be Dell Shannon. And so that's where he came up with the name. And it was just kind of that simple. So as the newly christened Dell Shannon, uh, he, he recorded Runaway and um, came back and, and was playing the High Low Club. And, you know, a couple weeks go by and he calls, you know, Detroit. He says, "Hey, how's Runaway doing?" And they said, "Well, it's doing great. It's selling eighty, or it's, well, they say it's selling eighty thousand copies a day." And he goes, "Well, is that good?" Goes, oh, yeah, that's great. In fact, you know, you're going to be playing next week at the Brooklyn Paramount. And he's like, "What?" You know, and that was that was like the place to be. So it was, uh, you know, in in the early days of rock and roll, you'd have like the Alan Freed show, and you'd have, you know, I mean, Dick Clark had his thing. You know, the, the, he had the Beach Nut Show, then the American Bandstand. Um, but uh, there was Clay Cole and Murray the K, Murray the K Kaufman, who's kind of known maybe more in the Beatles circles. Um, but he was uh, he was putting on the show with Clay Cole in New York. So you know, next week Dell's out there playing at the he's singing Runaway at the Brooklyn Paramount, and he has to share uh, a dressing room with Dion and Bobby Bobby V, and uh, he's. So he's in, you know, he's he's kind of awestruck a little bit because he sings all those songs, you know, every day at the at the Hilo Club, and now all of a sudden he's in the same dressing room with him, and it, he walks in, and the first impression is not a good one because he steps on Dion's toe. And Dion is, you know, from from the Bronx, kind of, and he's like, hey, who's this guy I stepped on my toe, you know? And uh, uh, so Dell was Dell was in a, a black suit with a red tie. And I think red socks or something that just wasn't, you know, cool for the times, just to say. So Dion says, look at this guy, you know, he looks like a farm boy or something like that. So he was nice, took him across the street, and they went to uh, a nice, you know, uh, you know men's suit uh, shop. And, and Dion was always well-dressed. He had all these shark skin suits and everything, you know, he's from that Italian, you know, good-looking Fabian type, you know, and, and uh, he got... He got Dell all, all dressed up and everything, so so they would look a little better for for the Brooklyn Paramount. And uh, so while he was there at the Brooklyn Paramount, he was you know he did Runaways I think six times a day, five or six times a day, and they would show like a Frankie Avalon movie, and then they would go back and each singer would sing their hit at the time, and there would be like fifteen or twenty people, but there was a lot of folks that were on that bill, you know, besides Bobby V and Dion, he had um, I think it was. D. Clark and, and uh, Johnny Mathis, and um, there's some other big names uh, on the show. Um, so while they're all hanging out and having fun, you know, Dell's in kind of the staircase in the back, and he's starting to write this little song that he had started earlier. And it was a, a song he had started called Three Cheers to Johnny, but the lyrics weren't working out. And he saw an advertisement somewhere that said, hats off to Sam, or Uncle Sam, hats off to Uncle Sam. And it was for some, you know, join the army or whatever it was, one of those advertisements. He says, oh, hats off, I like that. So he changed it. Well, hats off to Johnny wasn't really going to work, so he changed it to hats off to Harry. And Harry was his producer, so he was thinking, well, if I can kind of grease the wheels a little bit with my producer, I can get this second song recorded. Well, I mean, he was, already had a number one hit, so of course he's probably going to record it. Um, so he plays it for Harry, Harry likes it, he says, yeah, we'll try to get that in the next batch of songs. So then Dell says, well, actually, I think we're going to call it Hats Off to Larry, instead of Hats Off to Harry. And the reason why um, was that Hats Off to Harry had too much of the <laughs> sound, so they wanted to change the Harry to Larry just to kind of make it sound a little more proper. And I think in the end it works, you know, and there's probably more Larrys out there than Harrys, so uh, that's kind of how that worked out. Maybe a couple more. 
I'll just leave it there. Um, got my cheat sheet here a little bit. So Dell signed to uh, Big Top Records, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about that because there's a little background on that. Big Top Records uh, was really born out of a company called Hill and Range Music, and they're a publishing company, um, and they published like a lot of the country and western music, you know, from the 30s and 40s, um, and you know. A long time ago, the, the money was in publishing, you know, writing sheet music and, and selling the sheet music to big bands. And big bands would buy the sheet music so that they could play in these big orchestras and big bands and things for, um, you know, in, in the venues and things that they would do. And then eventually it became, the more, more money was made in records than it was in, in, uh, in sheet music. So Big Top Records was born because they were trying to get Elvis, and Elvis' uh, promoter was uh, Colonel Tom Parker, and he had been with the circus beforehand, and they thought, well, if you do the Circus Tin uh, logo, which is the one you see there, and then Big Top, you know, with the tin, you know, it kind of has that, they figured, and then the, the pink and black came from one of Elvis's suits. So that's where the pink and black comes from. So they thought, you know, if if we create Big Top Records and we have our own label, you know, we, we try to get uh, Colonel Parker, we can try to get Elvis signed to, to, uh, to Big Top. Well, the, the plan had backfired because um, Elvis's promoter there used Big Top as leverage to get Elvis a better contract when he renegotiated with RCA. So they didn't get Elvis. But Big Top, those, they had a, a big stable of, of songwriters, you know, Otis Blackwell and Doc Thomas and Mort Schumann, uh, probably some names that you've heard out of the Brill Building out of New York, where they did all, it was like the hit factory, it's where everybody wrote these songs for all the artists, and they came out of New York out of one building, or most of them did. And uh, they wrote a lot of songs for Elvis, and there was always a demand because Elvis needed, you know, 12 songs for a movie or six songs for the next album, you know, and he was doing another movie, and so they needed to write the songs, and boom, boom, boom. So writing all these songs for Elvis. Uh, so it was luck, it was, it was kind of good fortune that, that Dell was able to get it hooked up with, with Big Top. Um, and the way that that happened is that his Detroit managers had leased uh, kind of a, a recording lease and, and with contract, they leased him to Big Top but he wasn't necessarily signed to Big Top. But what that did is that, that allowed Runaway to, you know, uh, kind of explode on, in, in, across the United States because it kept the records on the shelves. You know, there's these uh, distribution problems that happened back then, and if you were on a small indie label, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily make it or be able to break out of, uh, you know, Detroit and go national unless you had a lot of push behind it. You had to have distributors that could get the records to the stores, and then they'd have to be able to collect the money, turn around and press more records, and that takes a lot. And you have to do it in a timely fashion, because if you lose the momentum, you know, the song falls dead and that's it. You know, you lose your radio airplane and, that, and then it's over with. So the nice thing about the Big Top Records label is because they had such big connections um, overseas uh, and across the United States with, with the whole Elvis connection, uh, you know, they were able to, to really do well um, and get runaway across uh, uh, you know, go international with, with over 20 uh, countries. So going back to Hats Off to Larry, you know, the three cheers to Johnny becomes Hats Off to Larry. Um, so, let me see if I got some of those lyrics there. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, some of the lyrics were, three cheers to Johnny, everybody tip your glasses high, for you played me for a fool, now it's my turn, time to be cruel, now that Johnny said goodbye to you. So it, kind of sounds a little like Hats Off to Larry, but Hats Off to Larry was obviously smoothed out, so it was, turned out to be a better song. So after Hats Off to Larry comes out, uh, and he records the Runaway album at that same time, he's doing East Coast tours. He's touring all up, up and down. He's doing uh, New York. He's going to the Steel Pier, Atlantic City. Uh, and then he plays, uh, well, he plays with the, there's Dorothy L'Amour, she was a headliner, a, an old um, Hollywood actress, and uh, Del was kind of second to the bill on that. Um, and then 
he's playing in a, a place called Tony's Mart. And if anybody's ever seen the movie Not Eddie, too much garbage on your Android. if anybody's ever seen Eddie and the Cruisers, that movie, uh, they use Runaway in that movie. But that's that same place where he, where uh, Dell was playing um, when he wrote So Long Baby, the third hit. And so how that came about was that he found a he was walking along the boardwalk and there was one of these little trinket stores that sold you know all kinds of stuff candies and penny whistles or whatever you want <laughs> and uh you know but they had these little things called hummazoos so it was a little round thing it was like a kazoo and it played like a kazoo but it was more of a round thing that you pop into your mouth and, and play it so he saw this kid who, picked, who, who had bought one and he was you know, you know making this little noise with that you know it sounds like a kazoo and so he picked that up and, and now Dell had this little you know, kind of ad hoc, he was able to kind of walk around and have this little kazoo thing that he could hum into so that he had an instrumental break. And so that's why he ended up using it in So Long Baby, uh, as opposed to maybe a musitron, you know, kind of a solo like he had in Runaway and Hats Off the Larry. Uh, even though Max did still play on that song, doing all the bassy sounds and everything, that boom, 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 that's still the musitron. Uh, Hey Little Girl was the uh, was the fourth song that came out, um, the fourth single, and that was written partially on the road, and then the rest of it was finished up uh, on Avenue A out here in Battle Creek, when uh, Chuck and Shirley were living at Brown's Trailer Park on Avenue A. Um, he finished it up there, and uh, that became his fourth hit, and um, again because of Big Top and the El and the Elvis connection. They kind of saw him, uh, or they wanted to kind of do something like they did with, with Elvis. They thought, well, if we can get our own Elvis, so to speak. So they wanted to get him into the movies. Um, you know, Del Shan is not as good looking as Elvis, maybe. You know, there was maybe that animal magnetism. Um, and he had to shave off a few years of his life. You know, at the time that Runway came out, uh, Del was 26, and, they, and married with two kids with a third one on the way. And his bio was written, they said, no, 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 you're 21, we're taking five years off your life, life you're single, and uh, unattached available for all women. So, so you know, because that sells better. Uh, and no kids. So, the big top label says, they work out a deal with the same people that wrote for Elvis, and they said, we, we got a couple songs that we want you to record. You know, and of course, Dell wanted to write his own songs, and he said, "Well, I, I got this song that I just wrote called I, I Won't Be There." And I said, "Okay, that's great, but we have a couple of songs that we want you to do, and we want to insert that into the movie." So it was kind of a movie package. So this is, you know, this is where some of this politics comes in. He has four big hits, and then he records two Doc Palmas and Mort Schumann songs. You know, "Ginny in the Mirror" and "You Never Talked About Me" is what the songs were called. And so those two songs, they decided to use one of them for the single, and the other one they were going to save for the movie for when they came out. And the movie was called It's Trad Dad, and that's what it was called in, in uh, England and Australia, but in America they called it Ring-a-Ding Rhythm, and it wasn't, you know, it was one of those beach blanket bingo type, you know, throwaway movies, but you know, they were doing all those twist movies and things around, you know, at that time, but it had, uh, um, Gary U.S. Bonds was in the was in the movie. He had uh, um, he had his his big hit, and there was um, uh, Chubby Checker was in the movie, and then Del Shannon. Um, so that was Del's first kind of break into showbiz. Uh, so what had happened then is they get on a tour to Australia. It was a Chubby Checker Bobby Rydell show. And kind of at the last minute, Dell was put on there as well because he had four hits, and they said, "Well, let's let's get Dell on that package too." So it was kind of a last minute thing, and with the movie, uh, so they go to Australia. Um, he has "Hey Little Girl." "Hey Little Girl" was like number two. I mean, it was only like a top forty here in, in America, but it was a top two over there because Dell was over in Australia promoting the latest single. Meanwhile, he has "I Won't Be There." You know, his new single here flops. That's his first flop. It didn't even chart. Didn't make the top 100 because he wasn't here to promote it, um, and maybe it wasn't as good of a song as some of the others. 
So when he comes back from his successful Australia New Zealand tour with Chubby Checker, who was hotter than hot, you know, with the twist and all the other things that went with it, you know, um, he comes back and, and he has his first flop. And uh, so they have to kind of work their way out of that. And, you know, the, his manager was, he didn't want to get any more outside songs. He said, well, you had hits with your first four, go out and clunk another song. You know, that was kind of his mentality. Go write another hit, go write another hit. You're only as good as your last hit. And he would tell him these kind of things. And, and Dell didn't like that when he was getting kind of bullied, you know, by his managers. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's trying to write another song and he's friends with Dion and Dion is kind of a doo-wop, you know, Dion and the Belmonts and he had already broken away from the Belmonts at that point, but uh, Dion had uh, run around Sue at that point and um, Dell decided to write a song called Cry Myself to Sleep, which has a little bit of kind of a doo-wop flavor to it. Um, but they decided to record it in Nashville, which is probably the wrong place to go. And that's only because you know, Dell was real interested in country music and he wanted to record in Nashville and he was pushing and prodding and pressing to go to Nashville and they do. Uh, but maybe that was for the wrong song because that song probably lacked some attitude, you know, they could have used some of that New York swagger. And, and not to knock anything in, for, to, to Nashville, but, but maybe something was lost a little bit in translation. Cry Myself to Sleep came out. It did, it did okay in the United States, but uh, it was a big hit. Uh, or a top 30 hit, I think, in, in England, and uh, Elton John cites that uh, he wrote Crocodile Rock because of Cry Myself to Sleep. So that was kind of a cool story there. Uh, but over here in the United States, it, it didn't you know, do too well, but in England it was a hit. So the, while they were in Nashville, um, they met a guy named Roger Miller, and uh, those of you that saw James Pope Newton perform the other day, you know, he told a little bit of that story that uh, Roger Miller was an elevator man at the time, but he was also recording, trying to make it and, uh, before he had his big hits. And he had just, I think he had come out with a novelty tune called Burma Shave. And the B-side was Fair Swiss Maiden, which was the Swiss Maid. Um, and they said, well, we kind of like the Swiss Maid. It's got this polka thing. And uh, there was a guy named Joe Dowell who had a, a number one hit with a song called Wooden Heart, Moosey Den. That was like a big, big hit that he had kind of beat Elvis. Elvis had made it number one in, in the other countries and everything, but uh, in the United States, it was Joe Dowell who had, who had that. So it's kind of got that Swiss made flavor. And so they decided, well, this might be a good novelty tune to get you back in the charts. So they record Swiss made um, in that same batch with I Cry Myself to Sleep. And uh, it comes out and it does okay in the United States. I think it was the top 40, top 50 maybe. And uh, it does, it goes number two in Australia and I think it was maybe top 10 or 20 in, in uh, Canada. But again, in England, it was like a top two, top three record. So he has all these hits. Um, so they do their first British tour. You know? So they, they decide to go uh, to England and tour there for the first time. It's the Dion Del Shannon show, and they bring Buzz Clifford, who had Baby Sitting Boogie, so he had a hit. And they, it was those guys on that tour. Um, they get through that tour. Uh, Dion was making fun of him at the time. He was saying, "Why would you do stupid songs like? They're not stupid. He'd say, See, why would you do silly songs like Swiss Made?" And, and uh, he says, "Well, you know, it's got a falsetto piece in there, and there's this gimmick." And, and kind of a no novelty aspect of it, and the oompa pas and everything, doing something different like that might work out. Well, Dion thought it was kind of cheesy to do Swiss made, but when he got to England, or when Dell got to England, uh, there was a guy named Frank Ifield who was a big singer there, and he thought, man, Swiss made, that's a great song. In fact, I got this song that's still in the can. She taught me how to yodel. Probably heard that song, but, um, or Neil, I know that. Because <laughs> he's from England. Uh, so there was that novelty aspect of it, and, and uh, uh, it goes number two there. So Dell's got like six big hits in, in England, and that's why he just explodes over there. So he becomes bigger over there than he does in his own home country. Um, so he's encouraged to you know, follow up with another song. He said, well, cry myself to sleep bombed, and I won't uh, 
I Won't Be There had bombed before that. So you kind of had two bombs and then you had Swiss Made, which did okay, but you know, he didn't write it. And so he said, let me, uh, his management said, why, why don't we pair you up with this guy named Robert McKenzie? And Robert McKenzie was a guy in Detroit um, who, uh, who had started on a song called Little Town Flirt, but he had all these ideas and he, it went on and on and on and on and never you know, ended uh, the song. Um, so Del says, okay, well, I invite him up to the house, and he comes out to the house, and he says, tell, tell me about a little town flirt, and he says, okay, well, here she comes, she's walking down the street, she's going to the shed, she's walking here, she's walking there, and they said, no, no, let's straighten this out. So they worked out some lyrics, and Ruby Red Lips became Tender Red Lips, and there's things that, that Del had worked out of that song, and then he, he incorporated, which, and this is up for debate, whether, whether the Mersey beat sound came out of Little Town Flirt or not, but there was a certain guitar sound in Little Town Flirt, um, the way it's played and everything that uh, that turned out to be, you know, just a, you know, just not quite as impactful as uh, you know Max Cook's Musitron, but it had that. It, there was just a good little piece in there, and then Little Town Flirt go, uh, came out at Christmas time, and uh, so it's not hitting the charts. You know, it's like number eighty-eight and stalling. And Del goes, oh man, well Robbie, it looks like we bombed. He goes, what do you mean we bombed? We're number 88. He goes, no, no 88, you know, we, we bombed. He goes, and, and this was Robert McKenzie's, the, you know, the co-writer's first hit. So he's like, 88, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah. And uh, Del's like, 88, I was number one, you know, with Runaway. So then once the Christmas music got out of the way and January came around, then all of a sudden Little Town Flirt took off and went 48. You know, 20, and it ended up peaking at, at 12, and they got a you know good hit out of that. So then Dale's like, well, let's do some more co-writing. Let's see what else we can do. And so they came up with other songs like Two Kind of Teardrops and Kelly, and uh, My Wild One and Two Silhouettes. So they had a few songs that they started writing together. Um, and there was there was a little story that I wanted to tell about Robert McKenzie is that when he got his first. Uh, BMI check, which is broadcast music. Um, it's for radio airplay. When he got his first radio airplay check, because of all the, um, you know, little town floor playing on the radio was for. Uh, he says uh, he goes. To, he calls up his producer Harry. He goes, uh, Harry, I'm trying to cash my check for a little town flirt, and they won't cash my check. He goes, Who won't? They, they won't cash my check. He goes, Who won't? He says, Well, you know. I'm, I'm here at the liquor store and they won't cash my check. And they're like, and I, I guess you could, you know, cash checks at a liquor store for five bucks or something back in the day. I don't know. I'm not from that generation. But uh, he says, well, I don't understand. BMI, I mean, that's a good check. It'll, it'll clear. What's the problem? He goes, they won't cash my check. He goes, well, how much is it for? He goes, ten thousand dollars. He goes, well, there. I mean, it's the liquor store. They're not going to cash it for ten thousand dollars. You got to go to the bank. You know. And so, but that was his mentality. He's like, oh, I didn't, you know. So then he had to go to the bank and go cash the check. But I always thought that was kind of a funny story. Uh, so they they uh, they used on uh, Little Town Flirt um, three Italian girls uh, that came out of Detroit called the Young Sisters, um, Patty, Angela, and Lisa. And they had a song called Casanova Brown. And they were kind of signed to the same label, and, and uh, uh, they didn't have any hits of their own, but they had a good sound. And uh, that was like another change in, in uh, Dell's uh, singles that he was putting out. Uh, you know, he, he kind of moved from that Max Crook Musitron sound, he's still using his falsetto and such, but now he's bringing in the kind of the girl group sound that started coming in in 63. You know, you start having the Angels and, you know, my boyfriend's back, and the Shangri Laws were starting to come out a little bit later about that time, you know, and, and uh, Lots of girl groups, the Ron Nads and stuff, a lot of those that started coming out at that same time. So it was a f kind of a fresh new sound, another direction to go to kind of keep yourself relevant and staying current, you know, with, with something new or something that's fresh. Um, so he does the second British tour. He, uh, he puts out a second album called Hats Off to Del Shannon, which wasn't put out in the United States, but it was put out in England. And essentially, it was kind of like the first six singles that he had, you know, the A sides and B sides. They put them all together, made it into an album, and uh, sold it out in, in uh, the British market with Hats Off to Del Shannon. It's a good title. So, and it turned out to be, you know, kind of like a greatest hits of the time, I guess you could say, because um, that's all that he had available at the time. But 
Um, while he was on that second tour, um, he was on tour with uh, Johnny Tillotson, and they were doing a package show and going from city to city and town to town. Uh, he ended up um, headlining in April of 63 at the Royal Albert Hall, and that's where the Beatles were uh, on the same bill as, as uh, Dell, but Dell was headlining, and the Beatles were, I think, number two or three on the bill. And so Brian Epstein, the, the Beatles manager, comes in and he says, hey, you know, the, the Beatles have had three number ones, you know, from me to you was the, was the third number one in England. And they hadn't broke, they hadn't, nobody in the United States had heard of them yet. And, you know, they're getting all this reaction from, from the British girls and the squirming and squealing and screaming and everything that was going on. And, you know, if you look at it from maybe Dell's perspective, you know, if you put six, you know, 1963 lenses on, you kind of just sit back and think, gosh, he's got, you know, he's killing it like Elvis. You know, the Beatles are killing it like Elvis. They've got these great songwriters. Um, you know, as good as Chubby Checker and all this, and he says, and, and he, they're tearing the house down. And he's like, man, I gotta maybe record their song or something. So he says, hey, John. And he goes up to John Lennon and he says, that song, it's got a little bit of falsetto in that. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna, you know, record that when I get back to the United States. And they're like, he goes, oh, okay, that'd be great, you know. And so then John goes back and he talks to Brian Epstein, and they, I think, already had an idea of their what they called war plan, like they were going to do Liverpool and London and take over the rest of the world <laughs> with the British invasion. So I think they already kind of had an idea going on um, at that point. And so they said, no, wait a minute, that's not a good idea. Let's not have you know, Dell do that. So they go back and they said, you know, John Lennon says, no, you know, don't do that. Don't record my song. Well, Dell did it anyways. And instead of waiting to come back to the United States, he, he, was, in, he was still on tour. He had, a, he had one day off. Uh, I think on the 1st of May, and he, he uh, recorded at IBC Studios uh, in, in London. Um, he did a couple other songs, and he did From Me to You. And then he, he sent that, uh, that Beatles song back over to the United States uh, to the producer, Harry Balk, who had you know, intercepted it, and they got that thing ready for a single. So by the time that Dell came back from his uh, British tour, uh, the single was ready to go, and Dell was able to promote From Me to You in the United States. So, um, yeah, so he, he uh, so after that tour, he toured Sweden and Israel. Um, the Little Town Flirt album came out uh, right about that time. And then, um, So on the left side here, here's a picture. Uh, Dell's on the far left, uh, and this is at the Albert Hall. When they, they finished, I think they all did an encore, they did Matt the Knife together, they sang the Bobby Darren song. Uh, so it's Dell, Ringo, uh, John Lennon, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and then you've got, I think, Susan Vaughn, and, uh, I can't think of his name. Anyways, uh, so Dell, you know, he gets to know the Beatles pretty well. He comes back over. He puts out the first Lennon McCartney song to uh, uh, to be released in the United States. Or, you know, first he's he's the first American to put out a Lennon McCartney song in the states, and uh, it goes number seventy seven in America. Um, but Dell had he started to tour Canada, and uh, I think that they got caught off guard in Canada because for me to you ended up going to like number thirty three. So it did a lot better in the United States, but uh, he had they were able he was able to tour Canada and he was promoting the record, um, and the radio stations started playing it. And once they once radio stations play one version of a song, they won't usually you know kind of veer off and uh, use someone else's version. So when the Beatles actually put theirs out on DJ Records, uh, it was already too late. Dell had already you know his was already getting. Airplay, his version was in the Airplay, um, and he was starting to climb the charts. So he kind of beat him to the punch, you know, in the battle for Canada, and won that. So um, shortly after, for me to you, um, his management company they they always mismanaged um, monies. You know, his his manager 
was known for being a, a habitual gambler and betting on horses. And sometimes, he, if he lost and he couldn't pay, he would say, "Well, I'll have my artist record your song," you know, um, in order to make you know square up and make it right. Well, sometimes studios weren't getting paid you know, for the recording sessions, and that ended up happening uh, not necessarily with with Dell, but. The, his management team were recording other people trying to break other artists just like they had with Del Shannon and Johnny and the Hurricanes before him. So, you know, you, they got to take risks and you're spending money and um, they're recording a lot of folks and it's not happening uh, where, where other hits are coming out from, from other artists. Uh, with the exception of Don and Juan, What's Your Name? They had a top 10 with that record. Um, but it, it ended up happening that uh, they owed Bell Sound Studios in New York a lot of money and they weren't paying the bills and so Bell Sound's calling Big Top Record and saying hey we haven't been paid for these recording sessions you can't just keep recording you know on credit oh yeah so uh, you know Dell's manager said we'll make good we'll make good we'll make good and Big Top you know there's a lot of frustration and you know kind of fighting going on there so Big Top says well you know what we're just gonna have to cut you loose so they cut loose uh, it wasn't Dell, but it was his management team, and so that whole management team had lost their contract or their lease, uh, leasing to to Big Top. So Dell misunderstood that as I'm free now, I'm not under contract, even though he still was. He had a five-year contract with his management company, but he decided to form. Uh, well, he he wanted to go out on his own and record uh, some of his own songs, you know, and, and do it himself. But he was blacklisted. Uh, by his manager. His manager would call the other labels and says, if you try to sign Del Shannon, I'll sue you, I'll take you to court. And he was, he had gone to law school, so he already knew a lot about that. Um, so he would, he would threaten all the labels, and so nobody wanted to sign him. Well, if you're under contract, or even if they, you know, smelled lawsuit, they didn't want to sign him. So, um, uh, Del's arranger, a guy named Bill, Bill Rommel, he was like the arranger and conductor, he says, well, I know a guy, Joe Kalski, uh, for Diamond Records. You know, if, if you can create your own label, they'll distribute it. So Dell said, like, okay, well, we'll do it that way. So Dell created Burley Records, uh, named after his parents, Bert and Leon. And, uh, and then they, they uh, Diamond Records, which was a smaller label, uh, they ended up dis distributing the record. Um, so the first song was called uh, Sue's Gotta Be Mine. Which, um, go back. The yellow one on the left there. And uh, Dell arranged it, produced it, uh, had to put it out on his own label, and then he had to uh, promote it. So he was without his, his uh, uh, management company, and so he's kind of doing things on his own. So he called England and he talked to the folks that had promoted him before. He said, hey, can, can I jump onto some kind of package tour that's money he was making was from airplay and doing his live gigs you know going you know, night to night different towns you know and, and uh, singing but he wasn't making any money off his records you know because his management was, was keeping it and, and not distributing that so he had to take him to court so he's having to fight all of this he has to start his own label he has to promote it he goes on tour you know he has all this weight on his shoulders and it goes to, you know, top 40 or top 50. So even though it wasn't a huge hit, I still think it was a pretty good triumph considering you know, all, the, all the things he had to go through at the time. Uh, so it's one of those forgotten songs. Um, and Brian Highland, um, Brian Highland, he, he, uh, he had a little good story about this record. He said that they were on a tour in Helmetta Fair, uh, at the Hel Helmetta Fair in Helmetta, New York, um, around July, and they were kind of going back and forth, like with songs that they were recording and singing and, and ideas and such. And uh, there was a there was this big song called "Hey Baby" um, from Bruce Chanel, and uh, there was some chords in that, you know. And they both liked it. Dell had already recorded it for Little Town Flirt. And uh, Brian Highland was using that song in his live sets at that time. And so they both liked Hey Baby uh, by Bruce Chanel. And uh, somewhere down the line, they, you know, maybe it was over a drink or whatever, they said, 
I dare you to write a song like that. And Del says, yeah, I can cop a song like that. I'll write one just like it. So Del wrote Sue's Gotta Be Mine, which was kind of based off the chord structure of Hey Baby, but it uses the, uh, the Four Seasons Sherry. If you listen to the Sherry and then you listen to Sue's Gotta Be Mine, it's got some of the same falsetto kind of gimmicks and things and the repetition in there. And then you gotta be my baby, be my baby. Um, and the Ronettes had, were number two at the time would be my baby. So there was three songs that kind of came together and Dell was able to fuse it in there. And so Brian Hyland was like, yeah, okay, I guess you win the bet. <laughs> I don't know what they bet over, but. Uh, so then, um, right after this tour, and, and Sue's Gotta Be Mine comes out, um, you know, Dell wants to take a break, and that's when John F. Kennedy was killed. And so it was, you know, the whole country's in mourning, people are reflecting, uh, you know, Dell takes a couple months off, and, and uh, it's kind of like the end of the, Cam the Camelot era, and, you know, they didn't know what was coming two months later, you know, the British invasion was on its way. Um, so not knowing kind of what to do, um, when the, he was working on a second single um, called That's the Way Love Is, which was like a ballad, and he always wanted to do a ballad. Um, but his producer always said, no, you're, you know, you need to sing up tempo songs, you gotta always keep them fast, you know, these runaway type songs and hats off to Larry, don't do ballads. Um, but Del wanted to do one anyway, so he did That's the Way Love Is. Uh, and during that time, uh, that's when the British invasion happened. You know, the Beatles come, they land in America, they're on the Ed Sullivan show, um, you know, and they take, conquer America, so to speak. So, uh, there's a guy in, by the name of Lee Allen, he was a DJ in, uh, in Detroit. Um, I think WXYZ was the radio, radio station. He calls up Dell and says, hey, are you, uh, are you, uh, do you know the, the Beatles? And he goes, oh yeah, I've met them, you know, a few few months back at the Albert Hall, and how are they, and, and all this stuff. And she says, well, you gotta, you gotta be able to get me in to go see the Beatles. And he goes, well, I don't know how much clout I have, but yeah, sure. So Lee Allen and, and Dell decided to fly down to Miami Beach right after the second Ed Sullivan show had happened. They did the first one in New York, and then the second one happened uh, in Miami Beach at the Deauville Hotel where it was filmed. Uh, and um, that's where the that's where these pictures are shot of uh, the hotel room. This is in Miami Beach uh, in February of '64. It's Ringo and Paul McCartney with Dell and Sergeant Buddy Dresner. He was the uh, he was with the Miami police, and they only had I think eight cops on the force in Miami Beach because they're separate from Miami. Miami Beach only had eight cops at the time, so they got, what are we supposed to do? So they had to figure out how to, you know, finagle getting the Beatles around and putting them in laundry carts and hiding them to get them in and out of the hotel and all this kind of stuff because they were so so hot at the time. Uh, and, he, and he didn't have the manpower to, to do it, so they had to pull all kinds of tricks to, to keep the Beatles around. So Dell had tried to negotiate, you know, for his friend, uh, the DJ there, that he, he says, hey, can you guys do an interview? And they kept saying, no, we can't do an interview, we're on holiday. And it turned out that the reason why they couldn't is because Brian Epstein, their manager, had signed a deal with Murray the Kid Kaufman, which was the, uh, the New York DJ that kind of had the Beatles locked up. He says he was the only one that could interview. Um, so they had to make a call to Murray the Kid Kaufman. He says, hey, you know, it's Del Shannon. We're, we're in Miami Beach and, you know, we're with the Beatles. And can, can this guy from Detroit get a get an interview and so after it, I think it was a day or a day and a half that they had to negotiate back and forth and it finally happened. But I always thought it was kind of a neat you know thing that he, he went out and saw the the Beatles a second time and, and uh, you know after they were right in the midst of the, the whole British invasion happening. Ringo, Ringo by the way loved Del Shannon but I think Ringo was probably out of the four Beatles I think he was the one that loved, probably loved Del Shannon's music the most. So then Del puts out the second Burley single, uh, That's the Way Love Is, the ballad. Uh, it didn't do too well. I think it it was like, it was a top 100 or, you know, 
nine, you know, top 90 hit. Uh, it did a little bit better, uh, I think, in the United States than it did in England. Um, so he, he ended up writing another song called I Go to Pieces, um, which was another ballady type of song, just like the, in the same kind of fashion as That's the Way Love Is. Uh, so when what happened is that uh, you know Dell was still under contract with his managers, but he wasn't able to to you know break free, and so he ended up having to come back. So he decided to renegotiate the deal. Um, he says, "Okay, you, you have to pay me my royalties." And he came with a lawyer this time because the first time that he signed a contract, you know, he just signed it. You know, sign here, I'll make you a star, or one of those kind of things. Well, now he had a lawyer, and he brought him in. They made sure they read through everything with a fine tooth comb, and then uh, renegotiated his contract. And so uh, that's when you know Dell kind of came back to do Handyman. Um, but he had this song written called I Go to Pieces, and he wanted to do that. He says, well, I got the song, I Go to Pieces, and his, uh, his, his um, producer, Harry Balk, says, no, that's not, really, that's not really a song for you. You know, that's, that's just like that last ballad. You know, the, you know, it didn't really work out well, and I don't think this is going to be right for you. We need something up-tempo, and we should probably do something back along the same sound that you had with Runaway. So Dell decided, he says, well, I know this guy in Battle Creek, his name's Lloyd Brown, and he plays at the club bar, and, and he's a great singer, he was like six foot six or something, he was a big, tall guy, and, and uh, uh, sang a lot of R&B, and, and he says, I'm gonna go and produce that guy. So he, he took uh, Lloyd Brown, and he flew him out at, at Dell's own expense and recorded him in New York, did a professional recording session, and then he tried to shop you know, the, the single out to the, you know, the song out to uh, to various labels and they didn't nobody wanted to pick up I Go to Pieces and it could have been either because they didn't like the interpretation of, of the performance of Lloyd Brown or it could have been uh, because of the whole blacklisted uh, you know nobody you know nobody signed Del Shannon kind of thing you know that was still going on at that time so it could, it could have been a tragedy either way and, and it, who's to say, and it, it's kind of lost to history there, but. Um, so Dell records, I go, to pe I go to pieces with Lloyd Brown. Um, nobody wants to pick up that, uh, you know, put it out as, as, a, as a single. His producer says, well, I want you to, uh, he says, you, you gotta get back in there and you gotta fight against the Beatles. Um, so I got an idea. Uh, and he says, Harry said, I want, to, I want to team you up with the Royal Tones. And the Royal Tones were an instrumental group that had Poor Boy back in 58. So that was a big hit. And they had some other singles, like from Flamingo Express was kind of a minor hit. And then they had Our Faded Love was a made it, uh, kind of a minor hit. And they had a couple members in that group that kind of you know left. And, and then they had a couple new members that joined. And two of the the new members in the Royal Tones was a guy named Bob Babbitt, who was a bass player, who ended up becoming one of the Funk Brothers at Motown, and they had Dennis Coffey, you know, later in the 70s of Scorpio fame. So they had two hot session guys, or recording guys, um, in Detroit that joined the Royal Tones at that time. And Harry um, had said, why don't you go, he says, that the Royal Tones are out on the East Coast right now, touring, um, you know, Atlantic City and all that. Why don't you go hang out with them for about a week or so like that, see what you guys can come up with, and then let's record an album and see if we can get a single or two. So he says, okay. So he goes out, he plays with the band, you know, they they spend a week or two together and they're they're getting some songs together nice and tight. Um, you know, they're they're uh, they're basically playing and, and you know and recording and living together, you know, they're for a couple of weeks, you know, on the East Coast. And some of the songs that they came up with was like Handyman, Do You Want to Dance? Um, they did versions of you know uh, Memphis, Ruby Baby. Uh, there, so there was a lot of covers and a lot of songs that other uh, artists had done um, because Dell didn't have a lot of time to to, uh, to write songs at that time when he was in the midst of you know you know trying to go on tour in England and he was uh, had had his labels you know the Burley labels set up and he was um, trying to fight the you know, his manager in court and everything, he didn't have a lot of time to, to write. So, aside from I Go to Pieces, which his, ma his producer didn't like, he ended up doing, uh, they ended up doing uh, Handyman, 
Um, and they didn't use Max Cook that, that time for the little organ solo, for those of you that are familiar with the song, um, you know, the Jimmy Jones song. They decided to record it with uh, um, a session guy, um, and it was an ondulant, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a musitron or a clavulin like, like Max Crook had used, but a little bit different, but it had kind of that same sound. And so they used, uh, so they recorded Handyman, it came out and was kind of put Dell back on the charts. And that was the time that uh, Dell had met a guy named uh, Dan Ruboys and another guy, a couple other guys, Steve Monahan and Doug Brown, and they would kind of become, uh, you know, new friends that, uh, you know, in Dell's life that, uh, um, you know, became good mates, I guess, for lack of better words. You know, that, uh, uh, Dan would end up becoming his, his new manager um, later down the road. Uh, but they met uh, this guy named Doug Brown, who had a, a, a group called the Omens in um, in Southfield, Michigan. Um, Shirley, uh, Dell's wife Shirley, was bowling at a league at a place called Norwest Lanes. And while Dell was waiting for Shirley to finish up bowling, he goes off to see this band playing, Doug Brown and the Omens. Well, uh, you know, Doug Brown ended, ends up being a producer and things later later down the road, but. Uh, he had a guy in, in the band called Bob Seeger. <laughs> and so Bob Seeger ended up recording uh, his first demo in Max Crook's uh, home in Ann Arbor uh, using Max's tapes and things. And then the second set of demos was done with, uh, with Del Shannon. And uh, Del paid for the session. He had some of his own songs, but these other guys, he, he was. Um, he had started his own publishing company, so he wanted to write for uh, other artists. But the deal that he had with his manager is like, well, you know, you're signed with us still. You also are signed to our publishing company, so you you can write songs, but you have to publish them under uh, under their publishing company. However, he Dell was allowed to sign other artists that were writing songs under his own publishing company and so he, called, he created his own publishing company he called it Shy Dell you know for short for Shirley and, and Dell um, and then let's see so they do a song called Alone in the Crowd and they and they do a few other songs um, you know that, that was a Bob Seger song that never got put out um, Alone in the Crowd and Dell does these uh, little um, falsetto kind of singing in the back when Doug Brown and, and uh, Bob Seeger are singing lead. Uh, Dell goes on a Dick Clark Caravan of Stars tour where they're riding a bus and they're doing, you know, two months or three months of, um, you know, singing and, and going around the country and they're shopping all these songs and they're trying to get, you know, other, Dell's trying to get some of his songs and, and uh, these songwriters that he signed onto the, uh, onto the tour. And so during this time, Do You Want to Dance comes out, um, Dell starts writing a song called Keep Searching. Uh, and that happened in, in his basement. He was just kind of toying around with trying to write a song and, and uh, his new friend there, Dan Burgoyce, not being a musician, he said, well, what's that thing that you did at the beginning of Runaway? It has that little, kind of that, that chord thing, or that, and he goes, oh, a new minor to G, that dun 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 in Runaway. He goes, yeah, that's kind of, that kind of a unique sound. So he's, he's like, well, yeah, you can kind of find it in Hats Off to Larry. Um, so then he writes, he starts, keeps searching, you know, the same way, he starts writing with that kind of a chord sequence. And then he, he ends up coming up with, if we gotta keep on the run, we'll follow the sun. But he didn't have to keep searching hard yet. So he's, he's working out the song, and then he had to be at a gig the next day in Dayton, Ohio. So he leaves, uh, his friends are driving his Cadillac on the way to Dayton, Ohio, and Dell's in the back strumming a guitar, and he figures out the lines, keep searching, searching. And so he's writing it in the back of the car from Detroit to to Dayton, Ohio. So here comes his next big hit, big hit there, and, and that's ended up going to uh, number nine. So that was a top ten record. Um, 
1964, and that was really hard to, to get to a, a number one spot because the British had locked it in, you know, between the Beatles locking up the first four or five, you know, the top four or five songs were always Beatles songs. They didn't just have the f number one. They had one, two, three, four, and five, you know, She Loves You, and I Want to Hold Your Hand, and From Me to You, and there were some other ones that were in there. And, and, uh, and then we keep searching that, uh, uh, you know, he gets to number nine, and, and he's back on the top of the charts. And uh, so then they end up getting up Whole, uh, kind of a promotion strategy set up. So they go to, he records Keep Searching and he had to leave that night um, right after the session to go to, to New Zealand and Australia. And that was, on, that was the tour where he was with Peter and Gordon. And I don't know if I got a photo of that in here somewhere. So uh, Del goes on tour to New Zealand and Australia, um, and, and uh, he's with the Searchers and Peter and Gordon. And he wanted to, so he plays "I Go to Pieces" for Peter and Gor uh, for uh, the Searchers because he's trying to get them to record it. Hey, what do you think of this song? He's trying to get their opinion. And the Searchers are like, "Well, you know, that's good. It's kind of cool. It's all right." And Peter Asher from Peter and Gordon, he heard it and he says, "Yeah, I really like that song. Is that is that? Can we can we try that out? Can we play it?" And so he says, don't give, it any, but don't give it to anyone else. Let us try to work, work it out. So Peter and Gordon kind of work with I Go To Pieces. They change the arrangement a little bit. And as, just before the tour gets done, they said, hey, Del, we want to record this song. And if you promise not to give it to anyone else, we'll cut it. And so he's like, OK, well, you might as well do it because no one else wants it. You know, he couldn't get it out with Lloyd Brown. Uh, so Peter and Gordon, they take it. They go back to England. They, they, they cut it, and they, they put it out, and it goes top 10. So, so uh, Dell now has two records in the top ten at virtually the same time. With I go to pieces from Peter and Gordon, and keep searching, and so Dell decides to write kind of like maybe the only song that could be considered a sequel to keep to to any of his songs, and that was uh, Stranger in Town, which kind of like picks off picks up from where Keep Searching left off. So the Stranger in Town has kind of the same. Uh, guitar, kind of an intro, you know, just like hats off to Larry. Um, and then, it, you know, but it's a little more grittier, a little darker. Um, one of the things that I like about Stranger in Town is, is the production work. They used uh, two by fours that they slapped together and they banged them into a, in an echo chamber to make this great echo. And uh, just the, the lyrics in there and the paranoia and everything in Stranger in Town is just such a good record. And that ended up inspiring Bruce Springsteen and, and Bob Seger ended up re having an album called Stranger in Town, but, but Bruce Springsteen uh, was influenced and, and wrote Born to Run, and you know maybe some of that was lifted from Stranger in Town. Um, so then he promotes Stranger in Town, and uh, this is probably, between Keep Searching and Stranger in Town, Dell finally got a lot of television exposure, which wasn't something that he was really uh, able to get prior to that. He, he was on American Bandstand for Runaway, which helped kind of push it to number one. Um, you know, and then some other countries he got on some other shows, but for the most part, he really didn't get on anything. He never, Dell never got on Ed Sullivan, so he didn't kind of have that, you know, that big push there. Um, but with, uh, with Keep Searching and Stranger in Town, he finally got some more, um, you know, television exposure, and that helped to bring him into the, you know, the top 10 and top uh, 30. So then he gets another uh, kind of a Frankie Avalon type movie deal, and it's called Daytona Beach Weekend, which was probably worse than the first movie. Uh, again, it was another one of those beach blanket bingo type movies. Uh, Dell ends up going, and it was someplace in New York, some building, that they went in the basement and they filmed, and they just kind of superimposed him into the movie. So Dell's never really actually at Daytona Beach. They just kind of Get, they said, well, let's do, I think it was Keep Searching and, and Run Away were the two songs they used, and they just kind of superimposed it in. But they had shot it in, I think, 16 millimeter, and then they had to blow it up into a, a larger format. So it was grainy when it came out on the drive in theaters. Um, and then, of course, this, it didn't do too well. So, uh, But he did get another movie deal, and that was, um, so that was kind of cool. 
So he's he's got a couple hits. Uh, he had a, another single that he was ready to release called Breakup, and uh, he was on the tour with with Dick Clark and the Caravan of Stars. And, and uh, Dick Clark says, "I got a proposition for you. I got a new show coming out. It's called Where the Action Is, and I want you to. He says, I have a song that's been uh, written already, and I want you to perform it." but you have to guarantee that has to be your next single, but it'll be a hit because of the TV show, because you know, it'll get that, that weekly exposure or daily exposure, so everyone will hear it and they'll use it as the theme song. And Dell's like, well, if I, he says, well, maybe we do the best out of three or something, and Dick Clark's like, no, no, you, you have to make that the next single or no deal, and so Dell's, you know, again, not liking to be pushed into a corner. He says, well, forget it, then I'm not gonna do it. And he, did, he thought the song was kind of cheesy anyhow, so he, he allowed that to go, and Freddie Cannon ended up recording uh, where the you know action is, was a song, and where the action is, um, and Dell ended up uh, putting out a different song called Breakup. So uh, it kind of left off where Stranger in Town did. It had a lot of tambourine in it, and um, it probably would have left him hoarse if it did become a hit because it was so it was probably so hard to get into some of those registers, you know. But uh, Breakup. Uh, Bombed. It didn't. It didn't do well. Um, and so, Dell said, "Well, you know, the there was more garage rock was starting to. Not, it was on the horizon. It wasn't coming in yet. But uh, Dell decided to do a song called Move It On Over, which was very garagey and kind of different style and, and uh, you know a little bit out there. Um, so he writes this gritty song. He co-writes it with Dennis Coffey uh, from the Royal Tones." Um, and they had this good little kind of lick that they decided to use. And with that, uh, you know, he puts out Move It On Over and he thinks it's going to be a, a big hit and then that bombs too. And so there's this story where he gets upset and, and uh, he, he had bought a house at this point. He left uh, uh, Southfield, Michigan and bought a little cottage out on Cobb Lake, which is out in Wayland, Michigan, kind of between here and Grand Rapids. So he buys this little cottage and uh, you know he's he's got a dock and there's you know the cob, cob lake behind him and there's all you know this little water and everything and he's sitting there in the dock and he's throwing all these this whole box of singles and he's flinging them out into the water he's like forget it you know I'm never gonna I have to kind of censor myself because he said some <laughs> expletives he didn't want to be in the business anymore he's like maybe I should just hang it up and you know Del Shannon's done and maybe I should just cut country you know you know it's all over you know. Because his, his manager said, you know, you'll only last five years, you know, recording artists last five years, and then that you're, you're up, you're done with the, the business and everything. So he, um, you know, he was upset, and, and uh, you know, he wasn't having a good night that night, and he's throwing, you know, he's frisbeeing all these 45s out in the Cobb Lake, so if you ever get scuba deer, scuba, scuba deer, and then uh, go out there, you, you might be able to find a couple of singles out in, in the water. Um, but it wasn't long after that, it was a, maybe a few days after that, he got a phone call from Tommy Boyce, uh, who was, who ended up writing for uh, The Monkees along with Bobby Hart. Tommy Boyce was a friend of his, so he used to write songs in New York and such, and he says, what are you doing out there in Cobb Lake, and there's no action there, you need to come out to, to California, and so Del goes out to California, he had a couple commitments out there that he had to do. Uh, a couple of gigs and everything, so he stayed with Tommy Boyce for a week or two uh, at his house and uh, fell in love with California, loved the sunshine. Um, he was probably tired of the snowy winters and everything in, in uh, Michigan. But, uh, uh, and he says, yeah, Dot Records would love to sign you and, and all these other record companies would love to sign you because Dell's contract was running up. He had a couple more months to go with his contract and, and at the end of 65 he'd be free with his old manager that he hated and, and he could sign somewhere else and he wanted to be with a major label and so in 1966 he would be free so he, he's hanging out with Tommy Boyce they're going around they're, they're going to, to their different labels and they they uh, happen upon uh, Liberty Records and Liberty Records um, they had a you know, they've got Bobby V and Gary Lewis and Playboys they had a lot of um, you know artists that were signed to that record that had big hits Johnny Rivers and things so he signs with Liberty Records, and um, the producers there was a guy named Snuff Garrett, um, who had produced a lot of 
a lot of hits, you know, for Bobby V and, and uh, even recorded Brian Island with The Joker Went Wild. Um, but they had an idea for, for Dell. They said, we, we have an idea um, for this song called The Big Hurt. It had this phasing and everything. There was a, a woman, Miss Tony Fisher, that had recorded it in, I think, 59. And they said, you know, it's been long enough now that maybe we could redo that song and put it out. So, okay, so they do it. It kind of sounds like this spaceship or something kind of thing. And, and they got this phasing kind of sound in there. And he records The Big Hurt and puts it out and it bombs. His first first record, you know, they, they promoted it, they put a little bit of, you know, oomph behind it and, and it, it had failed. So they kind of go back to the drawing board and they get a different arranger and conductor. They said, well, let's, let's change it up a little bit. And uh, that's when um, Barry McGuire had like Eve of Destruction and that kind of sound was out at the time. So uh, Dell had written a song called For a Little While. And so he wanted to go with an original. He said, well, let's use one of my songs. And so he had it set up. Uh, where he had a couple songs that he was going to record, and for a little while was his next uh, um, single that he put out, and it had kind of that Barry McGuire maybe feel to it a little bit, because um, it was kind of an angry uh, song. So he does that. Uh, it you know he promotes it. He goes out to Detroit and and, uh, and across the Midwest and everything, and, and uh, it it kind of bombed, and so. He's back, kind of the drawing board. And he says, well, God, maybe I should look at something else. Maybe I should, maybe I should get into producing or something. You know, the Beatles are still hot. The Rolling Stones are out now. The Rolling Stones were hot, and uh, so he he starts hanging out at some of the clubs. And he goes to this club called the Palomino, and he meets a guy named Johnny Carter. And Johnny Carter is a country guy, and he's just singing there. He's working with a uh, a band, Red Roads and the Detours. He was just one of the singers there for that band. And he wasn't signed to anybody, and he liked uh, Dell. I'd like to sing, and so he said, "You know, I could probably get you a deal with Liberty Records." So he takes him out to Liberty, and Liberty likes him. They had a sub label called Imperial, and, and uh, they said, "Well, if you'll produce him, we'll sign him." So Dell was of course, and he had a couple songs he had written in the country style that he couldn't do anything with anyway, since it was rock and roll. So he gives it to. Uh, uh, Johnny Carver to, to sing, and, and Dell wrote those, pr produced and arranged a single that kind of got Johnny Carver's um, career going. And so now Dell was at a crossroads where they said, "Well, you know, okay, do you want to do you want to continue producing Johnny Carver and relocate to Nashville, or do you want to stay where you're at, and stay in the rock vein?" So he had this uh, decision that they had to make, and. Uh, he had just relocated his family from Detroit to California and to uproot the family again to go to Nashville. He said, you know, I'll just stay in California. I like the weather here anyways. Uh, so he, he kind of gladly gave up Johnny Carver to a, another producer named Scotty Turner who ends up later having hits with, uh, with Johnny Carver. And, and uh, he gets, well, Johnny Carver ends up doing like Tie Yellow Ribbon and uh, Afternoon Delight, and he, he did some other songs. Uh, um, and Dell goes into uh, recording another song. So he has he has this other song left over from the Big Hurt called Show Me, which was a great song, um, but it bombed. So now he had three singles that didn't make it for this new label that he was recording for. So he goes, well, I need to go back to the drawing board. What can I do that's different? So he's at least he's thinking forward, where he's trying to get a new sound. You know, if something fails, he's not trying to rehash it. He's trying to move in the forward direction. So the Rolling Stones were hot. Um, there was a new album that they had put out called Aftermath, and, and uh, it had a song on there called Under My Thumb, which the Rolling Stones had written um, and put on the album, but they didn't uh, put it out as a single. So Dell saw that as an opportunity. He says, you know what, from me to you with the Beatles, maybe I'll do the same thing with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Good thought, anyways. So he puts out Under My Thumb, and uh, I mean, the, the production was good. You know, the, the singing was excellent. Um, the Rolling Stones version is a little over three minutes, so Dell did take the last verse out to make it radio friendly and keep it under three minutes so that radio DJs would play it. And it did make a little bit of noise. It didn't really chart, but it did get into the low 100s and he was able to tour. Um, but it caught the eye of a guy named Andrew Lou Goldham, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, so when that song didn't uh, didn't make it, um, Tommy Boyce and his friend Bobby Hart they said, you know, we've always been chomping at the bit to, to to do a song with you. Why don't you do one of our songs? Let us produce you. You know, and they had the Monkees at the time. And the Monkees had just started, and um, they had you know a couple of hits already. With Tom, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart had written like six or seven songs on the Monkees' first album, so they were hot property at the time. So Dell goes, okay, yeah, let's let's get together. So they do. So Dell sings one of their songs called She, and it was recorded great. Uh, he went to England to promote it, um, and the Monkees label decided to put it out on the album at the same time. So now you got a split airplay. You got the Monkees and you got Del Shannon. So you know the DJs are kind of confused as to far as far as which one to play. So they're they're playing the Monkees version in, in the United States, and they but they were playing they started playing um, Dell's version in, in uh, England, um, but eventually they you know the Monkees were so hot at the time that they ended up just kind of going with that. So Dell had another failed kind of a, a single there, but it had you know between that and and um, uh, under my thumb it had caught the attention of the Rolling Stones producer, Andrew the Golden, and he's, he got together with Dell and he says, look, I want to produce you, I want to record you, let's do an album together. Uh, and so Dell's like, okay, well, what do you have in mind? He says, I, I have, what I have in mind is the answer to the Beach Boys uh, pet sounds. I want to do something like that. So then Dell's very intrigued. He said, oh, so then he had to call Liberty, uh, the executives there, to see if he could get that kind of a budget, because Andrew the Golden's expensive. So he said, they had an idea. He said, we want to use 30 session musicians and record 10 or 11 songs. And then they decided they wanted to re-record Runaway. Um, so they had all this stuff going on. But they wanted to do it all in this English Baroque kind of pop. So he, Del gets together with Andrew Lugoldum, and they record this great album. Uh, and then here in the United States, the Monterey Pop Festival happens. And all of a sudden, everybody kind of turns from wearing suits to wearing Nehru jackets and and uh, being enlightened and um, uh, getting into the psychedelic era. So he has this great he has this great album that kind of gets shelved um, by Liberty Records. They decide not to put it out because they said, well, it's kind of passe now, even though they, in hindsight, they probably should have put it out. But um, so Dell ended up having to do a, a different uh, album called The Further Adventures of Charles Westover. And, um, that was more in the kind of the psychedelic realm, and, and at that point, people were trying to reinvent themselves or um, being the real self, and so that's why he named it after himself, like the Further Adventures of Charles Westover. Uh, Bobby Darren was doing the his um, his original name, and Bobby V, I think, was doing Robert Thomas Fellaine. So they were all kind of following each other into this direction that probably led to nowhere. Um, but there was, you know, good songs that came out of that, and it was a period piece, and um, it ends up uh, kind of standing the test of time. You know, it's it's its own time capsule in a way. Uh, Runaway '67, uh, or it's it's called Runaway, but it was recorded in '67. It was a re-recording of, of Runaway with Andrew Oldham. Uh, it didn't do anything in the United States. Here's the Home and Away sessions um, with uh, Andrew the Golden, the, uh, the Stones producer. <laughs> same time because Dell was recording uh, when you record an album you'll you'll do maybe three or four or five of your own songs and maybe six or seven covers of other people's songs um, and so Dell was recording like red 
Red Rubber Ball and, and Time Won't Let Me, and so he's doing some of these covers of other uh, other bands, you know, that are having hits. And Sunny by Bobby Hebb, you know, these kind of songs. So uh, he ends up getting a, a tour of the Philippines, and he gets over there with Shirley, and um, he's going to do his regular hits. And he sees this big orchestra, and he goes, "What the heck is that for?" He goes, well, "That's for we, you know." He says, "I only need a four-piece band or a five-piece band, you know, behind me." And they're like, "No, no, we we need this, and you need the trumpet section." And he's like, "For what?" He goes, "Well, you know, Sunny." He goes, "No, Sunny's a Bobby Hebb song. I only cut it for the album." He goes, no, your hit, your your cover version was number one here in the Philippines. And so he's like, it was? And sometimes labels would do that, you know, that they would they would re, they would get a, a recording artist to record, you know, a quick cover, they called it, you know, quick cover a song, and then put it out in different countries. So, so if you if you had a hit here in the United States, another artist would record it, but then put it out in that other country and maybe that other artist would have a number one hit. Or, or you know, have a hit with that song. Uh, so in that case, it just happened. You know, Dell didn't know that he had four or five songs in the charts at the time. You know, in the Philippines, and so he had thirty thousand people, you know, coming to see him in this big orchestra, and he didn't know the words. So he had to have Shirley stand there with this big sign there, with all the you know, Sunny. Yesterday my life was filled with rain. You know, because Dell didn't remember the words. He only sang it at the in the recording session. So he's going through all these songs, and you know, the, and he's a big hit in the Philippines. And he gets back uh, from the Philippines, and and um, the box tops had the letter. You know, my baby just wrote me a letter. Um, so he ends up recording that song. He says, "Well, gosh, if I had a couple number one hits there, you know, I might as well just do that as well and put that out." So he puts out uh, the letter, and then he um, he gets into his his Liberty contract ends up. It was a three-year uh, contract with three albums and ten singles was, was what he had to do. So he had one more single to go. He put out a, a cover version of D. Clark's Raindrops. He put it out, it sounded pretty good. It had a tambourine and things in there, kind of like uh, Green Onions, you know, so it had some, some of that kind of going on. And, and, uh, but it didn't make it. Um, uh, so, you know, Dell's contract ended up uh, expiring with Liberty Records. And Dell thought, well, maybe I should just get into producing. You know, he was getting older. He's, he was pushing 40 at that time. You're not a teen idol or anything anymore. And uh, that's when uh, he came upon, uh, upon a group uh, called Smith. And Smith had a, um, they had three singers in the band, but they were a cover band at the Palomino Club in California. And uh, one of the singers was female, Gail McCormick, who was, Blonde haired and blue eyed, but had a she had a soul kind of bluesy voice. And uh, when Dell saw that band, he said, "Man, the, he, he said, I could do something with this band because they're so good, you know. And if we could just get him into a studio and really get him rehearsed, you know, we could get something going there." So he he talks to the band and uh, he, he goes out and tries to get them a, a recording contract and gets them signed to Dunhill Records. And uh, Dunhill Records and and um, in California said, well, we'll only take them if you sign, too. So I was like, okay, gladly. So Dell signs with that label. They start working up, uh, Dell starts producing and working up um, uh, the Shirelles' Baby, It's You, uh, he, with the, the group called Smith. And Smith um, ends up getting a number three hit with that. And so, of course, you know, Dell's in the pr producer's mood, and, and uh, he wants to do more of that kind of, uh, you know, recording with other, you know, He's trying to reach in other artists what he's trying to do with himself, but he's trying to find someone 10 or 20 years younger. So Brian Hyland um, is about eight or nine years younger than, than Dell was, and, and uh, uh, Brian Hyland had, he had Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny, Yellow Polka Dog Bikini, and Sealed With a Kiss, and Jeannie Come Lately, and uh, then he had The Joker Went Wild, but then he went about a couple years without uh, any hits, and he was, he was starting to dry up. And so, Dell said, you know what, you have a great marketable voice, Brian. Um, I think we could do something with you. Let's kind of reinvent you. So they kind of took him out of that itsy bitsy, you know, Frankie Avalon, Fabian kind of um, sound and kind of brought him more current. They took him out of the kind of the kitty songs and more into the, or I should say teenage kind of songs, into more of an adult theme. So I thought in Brian and what he saw in himself. And so they recorded 
um, Gypsy Woman, which went also a top five. So here's Dell as a producer now with the top five with Smith and Baby It's You and with Gypsy Woman. And then they had a big hit, you know, with, with Brian Allen. So Dell and Brian got together again. They produced um, the uh, Jackie Wilson hit Lonely Teardrops. They put that out and uh, that went top 40. And then, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, they kind of went their, their separate ways and, and uh, um, you know, they had nostalgia sh package tours started coming in in the 70s and, and uh, Dell got onto those Dick Clark um, TV specials and they would do the, you know, and then there was the, the midnight special um, that was out in the 70s and he, he'd do uh, kind of the nostalgia packages and kind of relive the old hits. Um, but when he could, he would try to find somebody that he could produce. Well, then in about 72 or 1973, he, he runs in, well, he, he does Live in England, um, which is an album, uh, which I thought was, a, was good timing. You know, you might as well take your old hits, kind of recycle them, put them into a live concert, you know, and then put it out as an album. And then you have something that you can tour with. You got something to promote. So Dell's got Live in England that he promotes, and it did well, it sold well in the United States, in Canada, in England, and in Australia, so it did pretty well for him. Um, and then uh, he caught the attention of Jeff Lynne with the Electric Light Orchestra, um, who was actually with, uh, well, they, it was The Move, I think, at the time, um, Jeff Lynne's band before that. And Jeff Lynne said, boy, I'd like to do some songs with you, I'd like to record you, maybe we do an album together. So they started working on an album together, um, and the Electric Light Orchestra got so hot that, you know, that they, they didn't finish the album. Um, so Dell ends up going with, uh, he ends up trying to record and produce other people. Um, nothing too successful. Uh, and then he gets into uh, 1975. He signs with Island Records and does uh, Tell Her No, and then he has um, a song called Cry Baby Cry. And when they, they make a little bit of noise, but they don't chart. Um, and, uh, you know, Dell's still, Del's, Del's still trying, but he kind of gets into this, uh, he, you know, Dell was getting into alcohol, he was drinking a lot, and so it started to become a problem at that point. And uh, he went to, to England in 77, and he recorded the, uh, an album called The Dublin Sessions, which didn't come out because he was bombed for half the session. And so after that, you know, when uh, things started kind of to really take notice, uh, you know, Shirley said, his wife Shirley said, I, I'm going to give you an ultimatum, you know, you stop drinking or I'm going to divorce you. And so that was it. That's all he had to hear. And the next day he checked himself in the hospital and, and spent 30 days to get himself tried out. And then right at about that time, uh, his manager, uh, Dan Brugois, uh they got together to chase down his copyrights, you know, from the old hits, and uh, they ended up being successful in that about 1978, you know, and uh, that was a windfall of money that ended up coming back to Dell because uh, uh, his previous manager had sold the rights to some real estate outfit or conglomerates that didn't know how to collect on royalties and so the money just kind of sat there <laughs> kind of collecting for a few years and then when uh, Dell and Dan had ended up uh, winning that you know and getting those copyrights back there was about two hundred thousand dollars that was sitting there that you know they ended up getting and so you know it's like hallelujah you know I'm sober and, and I got my copyrights back and they, there's two hundred thousand dollars and Let's do an album, or let's kind of get back in shape. And he did. You know, he got he got in shape. He started running and exercising. He started eating healthy. He wasn't drinking anymore. And that was about the time that uh, a man by the name of Tom Petty uh, kind of fell into his life. And uh, Tom Petty was working at um, he had just left Shelter Records and uh, signed with MCA MCA Records. And um, uh, there was a guy named Harvey Kubernick who was uh, a publicist for Jeff Lynn in the Electrified Orchestra, and he said, Tom Petty and Del Shannon should get together. And 
company called Dan's Office, and uh, Dan was very familiar with who Tom Petty was, and, and Dell had heard of him, but he wasn't too familiar, and so he listened to a couple albums and thought, oh my God, I love Tom Petty's, you know, guitar work and everything in those in those records there. Um, so they decided to get together. They met in, in Dan's office in Hollywood, and uh, they decided to, to we'll let Tom Petty go ahead and produce an album. So they started. To, they got together. They started working on uh, an album called Drop Down and Get Me, um, which produced, which was a uh, it included a single called Sea of Love. That was the old Phil Phillips uh, song, Sea of Love, and uh, that ended up going top thirty for Dell in 1981. And he hadn't been on the charts for 16 years. So just to be back on the charts with a comeback album with a hot producer named Tom Petty, who was already a big name at that time, you know, put kind of put Dell back on the map and his his uh, uh, his fan base kind of kind of came back and and uh, you know and, and uh, that reinvented himself a little bit with a new sound. Um, so Dell toured with that Drop Down and Get Me album that Petty had produced. Uh, and he, all, all across, you know, in 1982, all across the United States, you know, he, he toured. Um, he, his live, his live uh, concerts were probably the best that year because he had a, he had a band that they had worked up, and he took the band on the road. And so it was the first time instead of using bands that were local, what they call pickup bands, he ended up having a touring band that went with him. So they knew all the songs, they knew all the parts. You know, they got good and tight, and then they hit the road and Del tour that whole year of '82. And then he did, uh, and then he went to Australia and, and promoted the album. And then he came back and went to England and and uh, and uh, you know had a big hit there in, in England. And so, so then you get into uh, um, the Nashville uh, scene in '85. He, he did some recording there uh, for Warner Brothers. He had a couple singles. There was a song called "In My Arms Again" uh, that went number 56. And then a year after that, in '86, uh, uh, Michael Mann from Miami Vice had had uh, phoned him up and says, "I want to use Runaway for Crime Story, a uh, new um, TV show that I'm doing." So then Runaway is back on TV, you know, 25, on the 25th anniversary from '61 to '86. Uh, you know, Dell's got his copyrights back. He's finally making money on Runaway, um, and uh, you know, so he's got that hit there. And then he does his last album, Rock On. Which was uh, right 1988, 1989. He's putting that together with both Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne, who were both fans and who had worked with previously. And George Harrison from you know the Ex Beatles had come in to record on a song called Hot Love. And uh, you know Dell's having the time of his life, and he uh, you know he's got uh, all this going for him. And, and uh, you know then 1990 happens and. Um, just out of the blue, you know, he, he com commits suicide in February of 1990. Um, and why? You know, nobody will really know. I think he took that answer with him. Um, but he was definitely on a comeback. He had a hot album that was just about ready to go at the time of his death. Um, he was tapped to record a song for the, uh, the movie Dick Tracy, which starred Warren Beatty. He was going to do a song for that. It was already selected and everything, and, and, but he didn't have t a chance to perform it. Um, and then there was also uh, a TV show. Lee Majors had done, uh, he was, he had, uh, you know, he was famous for The Six Million Dollar Man, and then he had The Fall Guy, and The Fall Guy had, had just ended, um, I think in 87 or 88, and then in 89, were, he was going to do a new show called Roadhouse, and Dell had wrote the theme song for this new Lee, Lee Majors uh, TV show. Uh, series, which ended up not going past the pilot episode, so it never really went anywhere, anyways. But, uh, but yeah, that was that's essentially it. So then after '90, um, Rock On is put out. Um, you know, there's great songs on there. Walk Away, Dell's voice sounds as good as ever. In fact, Dell's voice is almost an instrument. You know, it sounds really good. And, and um, you know, then uh, then the memorials kind of came out. We did the Battle Creek Memorial. And, here on uh, Capitol Avenue in 1990, and then in 1996 up in Coopersville, the memorial uh, that was put up there for him, and uh, Dell got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999, and uh, 
you know, finally, you know, we come back to Battle Creek here and with the memorial dedication or the uh, the uh, museum dedication last year, and then uh, you know this year we had to got a book coming out and uh, there was a 12 CD set um, by Demon Records that was just put out. And I don't know if any of you guys have got that, but if you haven't and you want to want to see everything that Dell's ever recorded for the most part uh, is in that 12 CD box set that you can get uh, through Amazon or through Demon Records. So, and that's it. And so that's going to conclude today's video on the Dell Shannon Historic Legacy event. I hope you enjoyed it. Dell Shannon weekend here in Battle Creek. This was the first year that we held this celebration and it was a tremendous success. According to everybody who attended, I had tremendous feedback all weekend. And it was a very exhausting weekend for those of us that were uh, planning it, but it was also a very wonderful and joyful experience too. So we hope to see you guys next year and certainly put it on your calendar to come out next June and celebrate Dale Shannon weekend with us. And if you like today's video, please be sure to hit the like button down there and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.